I am a child labor survivor and forced marriage survivor. My name is Nasreen Saik. I come from a very rural village on the border of India and Nepal. Most of the people are undocumented, which means like the people who born there or died there, there's no birth certificate. So because of that, I also don't know how old I am. I can guess 25, 26, 27 years old. My village was completely male-dominated society and uh, I saw my aunt being murdered for speaking up for herself and I witnessed my 12 year old sister being forced into marriage and my mom she said that this is what happened to me this is what is happening to your sister and someday it will happen to you I chose to run away the village because I did not want it to be forced into marriage. One of my cousin who was working in the sweatshops he took me from the village to Kathmandu when I was around 9 or 10 year old. When I came to the Swatshaw for the first time, they teach me how to do the stitch just straight. And then uh, I was keep practice, practice. I would do the brooming and I would wash the dishes or collecting the water, but mostly in the machine. And my machine was like higher than me. So we had to put other stack of clothes so I could fit in the machine. It took me almost two months to look out of the window because I was so scared. I come from like such a such a small village and then all of a sudden I'm in the big city. It gave me a shock. In the Shwetsa, six of us, four of them were adult, lived, worked, slept in 10 by 10 room without bed or bathroom or having access to even clean drinking water. We were paid less than $2 and forced to work almost 12 to 15 hours a day. We had piles of orders, like 500 pieces, 600 pieces, and we needed to finish that on time. And if we did not finish, we will not get paid at all. So for that reason, we had to wake up sometime 4 a.m., 5 a.m. and work all the way to midnight and still the pile of clothes will be not finished. We didn't have any day off, like seven days work, work, like one order will come and the second order is coming back again. It was like cycle. Sometimes we also would die. My hand would stay black almost for a week. And then I would put kerosene in my hand and try to take off that color. And then the kerosene tastes like a smell when I would eat food. The rice and lentils were like very low nutrition food they gave. And my food, all of the dust of the clothes, like the little fibers will go into the food. And often I would pick up like that long threads from my food. So much chemicals are dyed in those clothes. And then eventually it gets discarded into the rivers and end up in the oceans also. It harms the earth too. Fashion is one of the most polluting industry in the world. I was not completing the whole piece. I was doing just one part and label or tag was happening somewhere else. The designs were same and same, like fast fashion. Thousands of pieces being repeated on and on. Our part was to just stitch. My little fingers, they were like fast as machine because I knew that in order to get a little bit of rest, I need to be fast. And that is when I felt like I was not a human. I felt like a machine. And I just hated those clothes. They were woven with the energy of my suffering. Many, many times when I was in the sweatshop, I would collapse onto the large bundle of clothes that I was making. Like I didn't even have a bed. And I would just daydream like where these clothes are going to, who is going to wear them. I started to talk to the shirt or the clothes that I was making and talking to the shirt and saying, whoever will wear these clothes, I hope they can feel me. I hope they can feel my blood. I hope they can see my tears. Because as a young child, I just wanted to go to sleep and it was not possible. And I tell people that like, whoever is wearing those clothes and some people are wearing those clothes right now and they don't know. If you don't know where your clothes or where your things comes from, you might be consuming suffering. I want people to know where your things come from so you don't have to consume suffering. After working two years in the sweatshop, it got shut down. The agent ran away with two months of our salaries 
and rest of the other people who were working with me they went to find work in another sweatshop and i became in the day i'm a street kid and the sweatshop room in the nighttime that was the place that i would come and sleep and that is when i met a complete stranger he was a monk and he was living in nepal and this man became like my mentor and he started to give me education how to read and write and with that i was able to seize my destiny the sweatshop room that space that is where my teacher would come for like one or two hours and teach me and at the same time the machine that was left over i started to use this machine and whatever the skills that i have learned in the sweatshop i started to make bags and purses and instead of like selling to the agent this time i was selling to the store and that brought a little bit more income to my life and then also gave me a dream that I can educate more women and girls who are just like me who are working for the sweatshop who are abandoned and disadvantaged by the societies so I started to bring slowly these women and girls into that place and I took a loan and then with that loan I brought like one machine two machine and then we were like six women we started local women's handicraft shop and that became the way to express our activism and what ethical passion looks like that became like a hub and all these people from all around the world started to come and our story got published in 2012 in Forbes magazine and we didn't even know what Forbes magazine is because when you are focused in your mission magic works you know and the people that you need it comes to the life in 2013 we built our women's empowerment center so far we have trained over hundreds of women and we are making sure everybody is being paid living wage the working conditions are good there's clean water we have organic gardens and that center is becoming a place for rest of the other society as an example this is how the work space should be look like back in nepal even i am published in forbes and i'm running these businesses my society in 2012 they tried to force me into marriage with a man i never met or talked once but with the help of my friends and families and my teacher back then i was able to survive that and i was able to escape that to the women the girls who are listening and who are feeling they are not enough they can't make that change i want them to just take one step my first one step was just to leave that village and be in the street and when i was in the street then i was in the bus and then i had to climb through all this mountain to come all the way here and it's just that little step that brings you to who you are and why you are here in 2015 when i came to america and i walked to these major stores that is when i realized like oh my god people are buying without knowing what happens the other side right now america is consuming 40% more than they used to consume 20 years ago america imports 3.1 trillion dollars of goods and services from all over the world and that contains slavery our phone the computer the clothes at what cost it is producing first of all i would say to these companies that stop importing human slavery it's like a chain so on the certain chain some people knows but they keep the information hidden most of these unregulated manufacturers use all these undocumented individuals who work from like secret and illegal sweatshop that are hidden in these all unmarked buildings throughout inner cities and slums and villages because the companies are not mapping their supply chain that is where the disconnection is because ceos are most focused on quantities and fast that's it not necessarily the quality also because that is why the shirt that you will buy in the fast fashion you wear for like few months and then it falls apart and rest of the human part and nature part climate part it just not even in our awareness you can make a difference the world is really counting on you and as long as you step into that power there will be change and if fast fashion is destroying and taking over the humanity you are the catalyst for that change alone i can do something but together we can do massive things